Good afternoon and hello everyone. My name is Rich Longo and I'll be your host for today's presentation. Today's webcast is on reducing your risk and cost with BMC's client management tool. Our presenter is none other than Flycast Partners' very own Kyle Hamilton. Now Kyle is an SE here at Flycast Partners and is an experienced senior solutions consultant with extensive experience in collaborating with clients on IT strategies. He's been in the IT industry for well over 20 years and Kyle has experience in a variety of IT tools and publishers ranging from IT service management, IT asset management, and IT operations management. His experience from multiple types of positions in the industry, allowing him to have the bigger picture in mind when helping organizations and companies with their IT needs. Before we get started, let me introduce Flycast Partners. Flycast Partners offers best-in-class implementation services and training in IT service management, IT asset management, IT operations management, IT security and enterprise service management, and workload automation spaces, all using ITIL best practices. Our professional services team is efficient and has completed well over 5,600 professional services engagements, both on-site and remote. As a company, Flycast Partners has well over 1,200 regular customers time that come back time and again all throughout Canada and the United States. So I encourage you to call us at 844-FLYCAST. It's 844-359-2278 or you can simply chat with us live Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. We have folks standing by to answer your questions, get you data sheets, white papers, demos, video links, whatever it is that you might be looking for. Or you can email us at info at flycastpartners.com. Now, during today's presentation, Kyle will take your questions live. That's correct. Type your questions in the question section of this presentation. He'll answer those live during our presentation today for as long as time will allow. So get those questions in early. We'd like to get as, uh, as many of them um, in as we possibly can. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Kyle. Kyle, I've just granted you control, sir. Okay, thank you, Rich. And uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. Again, my name is Kyle Hamilton. I'll be providing today's presentation, walking you through some of the, the capabilities and features of BMC client management, as well as hopefully answering your questions. So with that, I'm gonna kind of take on take you through a tour of some of the, the primary capabilities and, and talk a little bit about how um, you can use them both to reduce cost as well as risk uh, when it comes to dealing with, with endpoints, with servers, um, and with the estate that you have to manage. So one of the biggest challenges uh, most companies still face today uh, in terms of cost is understanding what they have, um, just getting a good handle on uh, what is actually in the estate um, and then working way beyond that to you know where is it located who has you know uh, uh ownership of it and all the other details like hardware and software details that you want might that you might want but first and foremost just being able to to understand what's out there to be managed um so that if there's cost and things like that that you want to manage it you can start to track those so the first capability that that underpins that it's going to be your discovery uh, module. Um, the first one that we'll talk about is the the network discovery or asset discovery. This is the the master list. Um, so this is a way to just get an understanding of what you have and what's out there and what it is. Um, so you'll see in this list that's up on the screen now, it'll find anything from your network printers to desktops, laptop servers, to um, things like IP phones, router switches, on and on, so that even for those devices that you're not going to be managing, like a switch or a router or an IP phone, you still have an asset record that you've collected and captured. So if you're feeding this information into you know, some other tool that's doing lifecycle management or you know managing costs and you know, service desk requests and tickets and things like that, you're pushing into a CMDB, and you've got a record for all of those 
other devices like those routers and switches and things, printers. Um, but for all those devices that conform to you know, Windows, Mac, or Linux operating system, then we have an agent that can take it beyond this initial discovery, just letting you know that it's out there, to being able to do some, you know, deeper inventory and uh, a deeper level of discovery through that agent, but also be able to then manage those devices. So you can easily set up client management so that you can use this asset discovery, scan the network once a day, making sure that you're capturing any new devices that might have plugged in since the last time you did that scan, and then have it automatically deploy an agent out to all of the, the devices that it finds. Um, or you can go through and, and manually do that. If you'd rather go through it, just select devices you know, individually and start pushing out agents to those devices one by one. You can do it that way as well. Um, but it does provide for that fully automatic, automated mode so that you know, it saves you time and effort um, having to deal with those devices one by one. If they're on your network, they're going to get that agent installed. Now, once the agent gets pushed out to the endpoint, it becomes a part of the client management topology. So this view is providing me with a, a look at all of the devices that are in the estate that have the client management installed um, and their current state. So you'll, it'll probably be difficult to see the little, the little black icons that, that sit up in the top <clears throat> um, through the, the remote, but those actually identify your operating system. So you've got the little penguin, you've got the Apple, and you got your window that displays in there. And of course, you'll probably see the color coding lets me know whether that device is online and active or whether it's disconnected. <clears throat> now there's also additional views that you can look at for this topology so that if you prefer to look at it from a networking perspective, uh, subnet by subnet, you know, I can open you know, things up and look at which devices are on, you know, which subnets on the network, or there's also kind of a combined network view. Then I'll show you things like the switches and routers that have been uh, detected or discovered. So you can actually see which devices are connected to you know, which ports on those switches and routers and give you an idea of the, the layout of the topology. Now through any of these different views, <clears throat> in addition to what you see here, there's also the ability to right click on any of those devices that have that agent. And you've got a context menu that gives you some capability and control through this, this one graphic. So if you want to drill in to any depth into the configuration, this is where you'll see all the hardware and software details <clears throat> that have been collected, um, both through these summary views, and then you also have the ability to drill into more detail if you want specific information on any one component that you may be tracking. Now through the same window or the same menu, I can also access my remote control tools. So this is a nice way to be able to remotely support users both on and off the network. So that I can quickly jump into uh, a user's console or onto a server if I need to you know, take some action um, and be able to jump into in and out of those right there from that topology view. Um, while I'm in here, I'll also mention the fact that you also have the ability to create on your endpoints a, a kiosk, an endpoint kiosk, so that instead of having to create software packages and push those out to users, what I can do is I can give them a simple desktop shortcut. I had to type the URL in, but that could easily be just a, a favorite link, um, so that the end user can actually, you know, save a lot of time by self-serving. So they don't even have to, they don't have to call the service desk, they don't have to, you know, contact IT at all, but you can give them access to a window that they can open up and you can provide everything from patches to desktop applications to, you know, scripted fixes um, or, you know, enabling the do, them to do things very easily, um, you know, without having to navigate menus or file systems and things of the like. So I can, install software that I may need just by you know clicking the install or you know 
defrag my hard drive, you know, by clicking run. Um, so this is something that you can definitely use to cut costs and time and expense um, by, you know, providing a lot of capability right on the user's desktop, saving them hassle and time to have to contact IT or the service desk to, to push those applications out to them um, if they can easily be presented. They can just access that little My Apps menu themselves and self-service the majority of the time. Now, there's also the capability within the latest versions of client management to do the same thing for users that may not even have the client management agent installed. So you can actually create a, a service desk, a web portal that users can use to support the end users without having access to the full-blown administrative console. It gives them the ability to you know, see all the, the detailed inventory information that they may need to see, but they can also access the remote control features as well. And they have the ability to do remote control on request or on demand. So this gives you the ability to um, generate a link that you can send to the user so that it can allow them to establish a remote control connection if it's their home PC um, or if it's a device that simply doesn't have the client management agent installed, doesn't prohibit you from being able to support that user as long as you can get them that link, whether it's through email um, or you can see there's other met methods. You just copy it to the clipboard and put it in a chat message or send it to them via Skype. As long as they can click on that link, you can connect to them and open up a remote control session with them, just like you could do for you know, a typical user that already has that agent installed, and we can easily access it through here, or again, back through the, the admin portal. Or if you're using any of the BMC uh, service management tools, Remedy Force, Helix Remedy, Footprints, Track It, any of the above, then the same kind of remote control capabilities can be enabled directly in the service desk. That way, uh, it saves time having to provide credentials and set up permissions for users to have to log in at all to client management. They can leverage their existing service desk login, but still have the ability to open up the remote control session, be able to look at the software and hardware inventory and have access to all the details they may need to support a customer, um, but save all the hassle of having to create accounts and manage things a second time inside of client management. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Now, in addition, at the same time, when it takes a hardware software inventory, you're also able to get a full inventory of the patch uh, situation for that particular device. Um, being able to see which patches are installed and what's missing um, so that you can use that information to make corrections if there are patches that need to be fixed. And you can easily deploy those you know, to those devices right from this window as well, um, whether it's on a schedule or whether you want to push those things out immediately. Um, that way you can address issues one by one just based on the, the results of the inventory. In addition to the inventory that's collected through that discovery process, you can also add additional information that, that help you track and manage the life cycle. So anything from cost um, to depreciation to, of course, information like warranty and support dates you might want to be alerted to. Um, as well as vendor PO and invoice information if you're getting into the actual purchase order and invoicing side. Um, so that that information, again, can be used to create alerts based on the you know, dates, as well as allow you to do some automatic tracking of things like book value and cost, so things can be depreciated over time, and be able to track things like time and service, um, and be able to get in uh, alerts and warnings um, when that life cycle is near, nearing its end and it's time to start looking at a hardware refresh or a software refresh or both, um, being able to set up you know, automated alerts um, as those dates approach or running reports um, to be able to pull all those machines out that are going to need to be updated or going to need to you know, be purchasing those replacements in, in short order. Now. When it comes to remote control, you also have the ability to use what's called direct access tools. This can save 
um, or it's designed to really save the hassle uh, of eating up all the bandwidth or simply needing to go in and do something like edit the registry or stop and start a process, um, stop and start a service. So I can do a lot of basic you know, features and functions right from here um, if I need to you know, shut something down or restart something, transfer a file. And I've got same kind of tools through here, but if you've got remote users working from home or they're working on a you know, slow connection, ISDN or of the like, um, you're gonna save a lot of time, or sorry, not a lot of time, a lot of bandwidth um, by scraping all that screen data out and just going directly in the back end. So you've always got the option. If you need to see the screen, great, it's there. Um, if you don't need the screen, um, this is a way to get in and make those changes and updates quick, quickly and easily um, and save the network at the same time. Now, if you're not talking about <clears throat> devices that are on all in one location, you also have the ability to distribute client management throughout the environment so that if I've got remote sites, um, or I've got a corporate office and I've got regional offices, um, you know, higher ed, we get multiple campuses. Uh, this is where you can use what's called a relay agent so that you can put those relay points throughout the network and again, save uh, bandwidth and network traffic by converting every as much as possible from you know, your WAN over to LAN traffic. So that if something needs to be distributed out to a group of machines, rather than having to push it all out from one central point 15, 20 times, I can push it to the local relay and have that local relay point distribute it to those 20, 30, however many devices are connected to it, so that you do things in a much more efficient mode and efficient manner. And of course, those users are able to get those you know, patches and those applications installed much quicker than if they're after, you know, come up multiple hops over the WAN. So you can place those wherever they need to go throughout the environment to, to aid not only in the distribution of you know, software and patches to the endpoints, but also the collection of the data from those endpoints so that, again, you're not doing inventory from a central point. I'm doing inventories locally and then rolling all of that information back up to that that master server so that I have visibility to everything when I'm doing local collection. And that way it allows me to schedule those inventories at off times. So I'm not, you know, not doing everything, trying to you know, go grab everything and pull all this information back for the entire network at once. I could you know, hit relay one at nine o'clock in the morning and then hit relay two at 9.15 and 9.30 and use that as a way to mitigate traffic. Now another important use of the relays, and I'll use this to illustrate this, is when you're dealing, especially now, when you're dealing with users working remotely, those relays also serve a purpose to help to allow you to provide all of that same functionality and, and feature set for devices that may not be on the network as well. They're at home, they're in a hotel lobby, airport terminal, <clears throat> doesn't make a difference. Uh, that's where you could use that, inter uh, that internet relay to enable you to remotely control and patch and do what you need to do with those devices, regardless of their location, as long as they have the agent, <clears throat> and of course they have a connection to the internet, then you don't have to worry about them having to connect to VPNs um, or wait until they come back in the office to be able to make sure that that, that device is patched, um, which of course you know, goes you know, directly to risk there and making sure that, you know, especially with users working more remote today than, than 18 months ago, um, being able to ensure that those devices remain patched and are getting patched on a regular and as needed basis so that you're not leaving the security holes and things uh, for, for those to probe at, um, but are getting those things deployed immediately without having again wait for weeks or months at a time, hoping that they come back and, and log into the 
the office or their cubicle at some point to be able to get those patches installed. I'll stop for just a moment and ask uh, Rich, do we have any questions from anybody as of yet? We have a ton. All right, let's start with the first one. Uh, I bet you weren't expecting that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Do you need to have an agent running to collect the discovery of the devices? No, you do not. The Now, you do have to have one thing. Now, the master server, that master server is going to do all of the, the asset discovery in other words, once you install client management on that server, it can do all of the network just by itself. And you can easily run 10,000 devices off that one master. So from a uh, scalability perspective, there's no, you know, that's not going to drive having to create those relays or anything out there. You could certainly do it most enterprises off of one box. Uh, but that's there, of course, just help. Yeah, to help say network and mitigate traffic and, and make things available faster. Um, but you no, know, the network scan can be done from one master server across the entire network. You just put in the whole network range that you're going after, and it's just gonna go through each IP address one at a time and report back what's on each end. Next question: what is the time frame for determining whether a device is online or offline? Well, that it it's a it's kind of hard to answer. Um, when the that's based on the endpoint, right? So when I boot up my laptop at home or I boot up my machine in the office, the first thing that agent does that's installed is it pings that master server, or it's going to ping one of those relays that it's told to connect to, and it's going to report to them I'm online. That's the first thing it does. It says I'm here. Because once it does that, you know, if it's been weeks or months or even days, um, it may be missing, you know, if it's been Patch Tuesday, for example, there'd be a whole lot of patches that need to be pushed out to that device since it's been on, um, or applications that have been assigned to it that need to be installed. So the very first thing that it does is says, hey, I'm here. What are my assignments? What do I need to take care of? Um, if it doesn't do that for I believe by default it's 180 seconds because it's got a constant ping um, and yet that's configurable of course then it simply goes red now you could still go into those devices um, and look at inventory of course and you know, dig into you know assign patches and things like that um, remote control would be the only thing that you wouldn't have access to at that point if it was truly off um, but Ultimately, whatever you set that little timeout value to from that agent is when it's going to go red. Like I said, by default, it's about, I think, three minutes is about what I think it is. But that could be set and set in seconds. Um, so it's configurable, but it's usually less than you know five minutes um, because the first thing that's going to happen within seconds of them booting it up is you're going to get that ping and it's going to go green. So we're really just saying if you haven't heard from that device in about three minutes, consider it off. Okay, uh, next question. Is the MAPS interface and remote support additional modules or included as part of BMC's client manager? Those, okay, let me, let me make sure I answer this the right way. And let me you, you go back to my slide here real fast and I'll explain my answer. So they are not additional modules. So if you get the suite, and it's kind of what I'm talking, I, I haven't really talked about this, but there's a suite with everything. These are the five licensed modules of BMC Client Management. So you can buy everything as a suite, and that's S-U-I-T-E, not S-W-E-E-T. Um, you can buy those as a suite price, or you can individual a la carte those. With the only exception of discovery and inventory, that's the only must-have, because everything else builds upon that. But... You could get just discovery and inventory and remote those two modules if that's all you need because we haven't really gotten into patch policy and OS and app yet. So as far as everything I've shown so far, you could get all of that in discovery and inventory and remote control. Now we're going to go on and talk about these other modules that will be a part of the suite. And you can do the same thing. You could get discovery and patch or discovery and OS and app deployment, right? 
everything else kind of is up on the table, but the only requirement is the discovery and inventory piece. Okay, next question. What is a remote control using as the underlying application? Windows, remote desktop, BOMGAR, or what? It's it's an RDP protocol, but it's it's not it's not leveraging, you know, it's not Windows desktop, it's not Team Viewer or anything like that. It's it's BMC intellectual property. It's their own remote control application. Okay, does it support iPads as well? Is another question. Yes, it does. So mobile device management is also a part of client management. Um, you'll get at the same time you do the the asset discovery I mentioned before, you're gonna collect the same information about mobile devices at the same time. They're broken out into a different list because they are managed differently. Mobile devices don't have agents. Mobile devices are managed through uh, what's called a profile. And so because they're managed in a different manner, they've separated the mobile devices out into a separate list. Um, but when you run that asset discovery on your network, you're gonna find the switches, routers, printers, desktops, laptops, et cetera. They're also gonna find all of your mobile devices. Um, then through those profiles that you push out to the, the mobile devices, it gives you the same kind of capabilities on your, your iPads and your iPhones. You know, you see it here, you know, set their security settings and what kind of, can they use the camera and can they connect to iTunes and can they use Facebook and things like that. Um, and of course, all the network settings, what wireless can they use and what's their mailbox. Um, so you can lock the devices down and configure them the way you want. <clears throat> Make sure they have the applications that you want them to have. Um, and of course, make sure that they don't or can't use the ones that you don't want them to have or use. And then also be able to, to push commands out to those devices so that if something does happen to you know, uh, walk out the back door, then you have the ability to you know, maybe lock it, tell them, bring it back, please. Or you know, if you need to wipe it, you know, if something does happen to leave, then I can go in and say, I need to wipe a device and go grab it out of inventory and say, please you know, wipe that iPhone. And you'll see up here, it's, it lets me know that it's now reaching out to, con you know, to tell that, that agent or the profile in this case that it's time to wipe that phone. And as soon as that, that profile responds, you know, message received, um, you'll get that update notified message, which means it's now in the process of being wiped and no more communication at that point. Can this spit out Excel files is another question. Yes, yes, you've got some, you've got export capabilities as well as some import tools up here at the top. So you can, and that can be done, of course, you can export through queries, you can export uh, through reports. Um, I think I ran one, I don't know if I didn't, I'll just run one. Let's just do, uh, let's take this guy. So you'll see right here at the top, I've got options up here to be able to publish this. And this is where you can easily go in and set up, you know, what you want, what kind of, if you want you know, XML or HTML, if you want the data, there's different protocols. You know, if I need to FTP it to some file share or file directory, store it. And I can set this export to occur on a regular basis, right? So right now you see it's got the scheduled disabled, but this is where I could go in and say, you know, run repeatedly, multiple times a day, you know, at certain times, um, you know, so it can be fully configured so that that export that you want to happen, or if it's maybe just a regular report, then you can have it generated and thrown out on a file share, or you can also do the same thing by emailing it out, where I can go in and, you know, send that, that data out to that user and have the email go out on that same schedule and having published at the same time as well. Any dashboard that we can see as well? Uh, dashboard in relation to anything in particular? I guess there's, there's several dashboards, like there's compliance dashboards, there are uh, software licensing dashboards. 
So you'll find dashboards throughout the tool, just depending upon what your focus is. But certainly, you, know, you have the ability to create these dashboard views in these different modules. So if you're tracking software licensing and you want to have a you know, license dashboard for the different versions you're managing, you can get that. Um, so that you can easily, you know, again, this goes to you know cost as well as risk, um, making sure that you know, you're up to date on licensing so that you know, if you're, you've got none available, you know, or you can see that you're getting close, um, you know, this kind of information, and you can see as I get, look at different versions, right, to break them down, whether it's different versions of Microsoft Office, or you've got different versions, things like Adobe out there floating around. You know, I wanna know if I've got this kind of scenario where we've exceeded license count, because that may catch me up in an audit and cost money, um, or we simply just need to know from a purchasing perspective, we need to go place that order. So I can come in and get this, and that's where you come in and you know add that that new you know license count so that if I go out and buy additional quantities, I want to make sure that that's reflected you know next time I go in and take a look at that dashboard. Same thing with usage. When is the last time they've used it? You can also do the dashboards I mentioned with compliance, which is another module that sits kind of on top of your inventory. And this is you know, directly towards you know, risk is, you know, are they fully patched? Do they have, do they have the right version of the software? Do we have you know, all that antivirus up to date? Do they have their firewall turned on? And all the things from us, it doesn't necessarily have to be security related. Um, let's just talk about from a risk perspective. It could be you know, compliance of, do they have at least 16 gig of memory? Do they have at least 100 meg of hard drive space available? Things like that. So anything you want to check for, you create a, a policy or compliance rule for so that um, what it really does is it takes all of the inventory details that you're collecting and it bubbles all the problems to the top. Otherwise, for me to determine who does and doesn't have their firewall turned on, I've got to open up one machine's inventory and look at the firewall status and see is it on and off. And then I close that and I go into the next one and I see is that one on and off. Or I have to run a report. Um, this way, you know, I open up my dashboard and I can immediately drill in here and say, you know, show me everybody that doesn't have their firewall turned on. And I know exactly who those users are, what devices those are. So I can create you know, a dashboard for every one of those policies so that I can see that information you know, across the enterprise or across the board. You can see I can continue adding other, other rules that I want to display, or I might even have other dashboards, right? This is focused around PCI, which is any kind of device uh, processing credit card information. But you may have other compliance policies beyond, you know, PCI. Um, that you want to create. So you may have a dashboard for each one of those. Um, so there's certainly dashboards available in each of the modules. And when it comes to things like patch uh, deployments, you know, when you go through and create what's called a patch job inside of client management, <clears throat> you're pushing patches out to a group of devices. When you create that patch job or for each patch job, and you'll see there's three here, um, it creates the another type of dashboard for you automatically where now I can see you know what's in what's in the process of you know downloading and executing what's the status of you know each of the devices you know that are set to receive those patches so that I can see that information for each different you know patch job that I've created. I can see the status of each device. What have they received? What are they supposed to be what are they supposed to get? How far do we have to go? Have they failed? things like that, so that I can report on that. And I've got you know, the, the history and the, the view up the top that'll allow me to drill in and see the progression you know, over time as those devices receive those patches and report back complete or failed, so you can track your progress. Um, same type of thing gets created or view gets built when you're deploying software to an endpoint. So all of this is done through wizards that you can use. And I've run through in this example, and I've created some software packages to deploy you know, Adobe Acrobat Reader, the MSI software package. And here's another install for you know, Firefox browser. 
where I can go through and grab those downloads, quickly create a software package, and then be able to deploy software out to a device or group of devices. And when I do the same thing here, and let's say maybe I want to deploy this, I, I could deploy this to everybody and just install it on everybody's machine, or I could get more surgical by perhaps using Active Directory, or I'm leveraging Active Directory groups and containers, or <clears throat> using the queries in client management to create groups for me so I can query the operating system so that I can say, you know, I want to install Firefox on my Windows OSs. And when I assign those groups or those devices, it's going to create the same kind of window here where I can track the progress as those assignments get sent to those endpoint agents, as well as providing some graphics that allow you to chart the progress as those begin to roll out as well. So for each you know, software package that you create, you'll have a similar you know, view so that you can track the status you know, of that deployment to those particular groups so that I could, might have that package assigned to you know, a group of devices I'm calling my demo machines, and that way I can track their progress independently of another group where I've assigned the same package. I just want to break it out and I want to track and chart the progress of that deployment separately. So those groups become important, not only in allowing you to target, you know, very surgically where you want the what devices you want patches on or what devices you want those applications on, um, but it also allows you to report on them independently, um, be able to uh, uh, deal with those groups specifically. So. When we look, when I talked about compliance on this dashboard, one thing you'll notice up here well, in a couple of examples, on all of these like anti-malware update, where it just says anti-malware update in this case, that's the entire, that's everybody, right? So I haven't defined any particular group, but I can also set up compliance just for a particular group of machines. So you see up here, it's added this little data center servers, meaning these pol this policy here, only applies to a specific subset of my machines. And I was able to, to make that policy stick on that one group because I, you know, I went through and I created a, a group in here, a query group, you know, so that I could make that assignment to that group called, uh, what, well, what was it? Oh, it's my data center servers. So that group is right here. There's all the members of that group. Um, so by creating that group, then when I want to go in and create that compliance policy, or I want to assign that, you know, set of patches I've just downloaded, I can now assign it to my data center servers. And because this is built off of a query, and you'll see here, this is where I can actually look at, and you can see, my criteria in this case is I'm just looking at the operating system. And does it contain, and you see these, these devices are somewhat out of date. Um, if it had 2008 or 2003, that meant it was a server, right? So you could go beyond that, of course, and you could add other criteria. You could look at, you know, what kind of memory does it have or look at the BIOS and that'll tell you, you know, we only have everything from Dell's in the data center. So you could add other criteria. But this enables you to leverage all of that inventory information you, you've collected um, about the device and be able to use that information to then create groups, logical, however it makes sense to you, so that now when I go to start pushing things around or assigning policies and rules, I'm able to say these rules only apply to engineering or they only apply to marketing. Um, so that I can, again, be very surgical with how I'm managing my compliance and which devices I'm tracking software licensing on and which ones are excluded from software licensing tracking. Um, whether that be you're not managing the data center and you're only responsible for the desktop, so you don't mess with those or whatever the case may be. Um, so a lot of capabilities around you know, being able to graphically you know, view the, the updates and the distributions that you're doing and of course, back on the homepage, you of course you got some 
predefined you know, queries that I see up here in the top that allow me to look at things like device distribution and what's my current patch status, you know, how many patches are we really missing and how many are critical. Um, so I can quickly go through and you know, look at some of the, that key information you know, for my devices. We also see here, um, and this is configurable as to what kind of information you want. I call this out because a lot of what we've talked about, um, whether it's somebody violates a compliance policy or we've exceeded our license count that we're managing and tracking, or as you see in some cases here, maybe we're, we're determined we've got way too much, stop purchasing, no need to buy any more. Um, all of those things can be set up as simple events that you view here in the console. Or you can also set those up as notified alerts. Many will simply get an email to send it out to the admin or admins. Or in the best case, again, if you're leveraging things like Track It, Footprints, Remedy Force, Helix Remedy, all of this interface is designed to plug into all four of those tools so that rather than sending you an email, I can create a ticket in the service desk that license count's been exceeded or create a purchase order in Helix Remedy that we need to order more, you know, Acrobat licenses. So rather than just notifying somebody, actually creating a ticket, you know, a service request or a record, getting it assigned to the person that, that needs to respond um, so that you can automate that piece and again, kind of streamline the purchasing and, and ordering process and be able to get notified on all of the, the different situations. So if they don't have their firewall turned on and you want to get an email or you want a ticket created, you can do that. But if you want to do it, nice and easy, that's where I can take, and this will be the last thing I'm gonna, I'll be able to cover, I think, for the day. I'm gonna wanna make sure we answer a few more questions. I can go into my policy that says everybody has to have their firewall turned on. I can pull up that list of non-compliant users. And when I go in to that group, where are we? Here we are. So when I go into that group, and I'm looking at, do they have their firewall installed or, not, or it turned on, and I wanna fix it, I can go into these operational rules, and I've got a shell sitting here, and this saves you a lot of time and hassle from having to script things. So if you're doing any kind of bash or PowerShell scripting today, this will get you out of it completely, because I've got a set of commands I can come in and execute. So I create a simple rule, called turn on their firewall, and I just execute that one command. Now I can go in and say, I want to run that enable firewall command on a group of machines, and I've created a group using my compliance module that says, here's everybody that doesn't have their firewall on. So now I can push that command out to just those machines that need it. And now I can correct that issue easily and quickly without having to even wait for a response. So there's different, you know, whether you want to be alerted um, or whether you'd like to, you know, have it automatically corrected. Don't alert me, just fix it. That could be done. And through those integrations to the service desk, all of these, like that enable firewall rule, if I want to make that show up in Remedy Force or I want that to show up in Track It or Footprints or uh, Helix Remedy, I just have a simple box to check here. I go in and I it's just not avail available to integrate here. Click it. You can set that. It's not going to. Oh, here we go. You can set that to available, and that now becomes an option that shows up in the service desk. So now you can create the fixes here, make them available to the service desk staff, so nobody has to throw those tickets up to me, and they've got the capability to to make a much more efficient, effective fix right there on the phone with the customer. Rich, we have, have time. More. Do we have we a have, bunch more? We have a couple more questions. Uh, we'll try to knock them out real fast. The, the, uh, the next one, uh, they didn't see the export on the uh, as an export option when you were showing export for Excel. They didn't see that as an option when you were doing that. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said uh, XML. No, there, there's no uh, Excel spreadsheet export from here. The, the only way to get the data out, or now you could do a you know, it's running on Microsoft SQL. So of course you could do an export from SQL because that's going to be the underlying database. 
but in terms of through the interface, you know, the, the data uh, only comes out in XML format. Okay, uh, next question. I guess this can be used in conjunction with SCCM or, and not replace SCCM, is that correct? Uh, this ultimately, in most cases, this does replace SCCM. In other words, it covers everything that SCCM does and, and then some. And the other, other ones were just comments. So that's the end of our questions. I, I think that's it for us today. Folks, if you have any additional questions, we have actually run out of time. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please, by all means, go ahead and, and send those to us. Uh, you can call us at 844-FLYCAST or uh, feel free to go ahead and, um, and chat with us live Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. They're happy to get you the information you're looking for or email us at info at flycastpartners.com. Both Colin and I appreciate your time today. We're very, very uh, happy that you uh, took time out of your day to spend with us. And uh, Kyle, thank you. Great presentation. We have several comments saying exactly that. Great presentation. Thanks for the invite. Thank you for the presentation. So quite a few comments for that. So thank you, Kyle. You're very welcome. Everybody have a great day.